Hi, right, engineers. In this video, we're going to talk about surface tension and surfactant. All right, well, what is surface tension? How would you define surface tension? So surface tension is really actually better defined when we look at it inside of this actual alveoli here. But for right now, we'll put like a little definition for right now. Surface tension is actually occurring because of two things. So surface tension is caused by two things. One thing that causes surface tension is there's, you know, inside of the alveoli, you have a lot of water, like just a little bit, you have like a nice thin water layer right here. And then inside of that, you're actually gonna have a lot of the air, a lot of the nitrogen, the oxygen, the carbon dioxide molecules, which are gonna be in here. Well, there's an interaction, an interplay between the water layer and the air layer. And we'll talk about it in more detail. But because of that interplay between the two, there's a certain amount of tension. Because what happens is, the water molecules don't want to interact with the air. And they dive deep down closest to the actual alveolar cells, type one and type two. And because of that, it creates this tension. Because the, again, the water molecules do not want to interact with the dissimilar gas molecules. Okay, so it's due to this air, gas, Okay, I'm sorry. Water, air, <laughs> water, air, interaction. Okay, so this air, water, interaction. Okay, and we'll explain that in more detail. And the second thing is because of the air, water, interaction, what this causes is whenever the actual water molecules dive down into the deeper layers of the actual water layer, it creates the shrinking of the alveoli. And when it wants to shrink the alveoli, it wants the alveoli to recoil and, and then collapse and produce the smallest size possible. And so again, another thing with surface tension is it tries to promote the actual collapsing of alveoli. All right, okay. So that's how we would define surface tension. And again, it's, it's, you, can, you can even add on to this. It's basically a cohesive interaction between the water molecules. So it's a very strong, cohesive, intermolecular force reaction between the water molecules. And then instead of them, uh, the water molecules acting with the air, they react with themselves and produces a tension. And because of that tension, it tries to shrink the alveoli and tries to collapse the alveoli and causes them to assume the smallest size possible. But for us to better understand this, Let's take this alveoli, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a section of that alveoli. So we're going to take this blue part, which is the respiratory membrane. We're going to look at the um, alveolar cells here, and then the water and air interaction. So let's go ahead and drop down here. Okay. So here we're going to have this blue layer that's basically the basal lamina, the basement membrane. Then we're going to have these alveolar cells. Now you know alveolar cells, there's actually two types of alveolar cells, two types. There's type one and type two, simple as that, right? So you have what's called type one. And if you read them in certain textbooks, they also call them pneumocytes. I'm just gonna call them type one alveolar cells. But again, you can call them type one pneumocytes or type one alveolar cells. And the type one alveolar cells are the ones that are primarily involved in gas exchange. So in other words, whenever the oxygen is actually moving from what, the alveoli into the blood, and whenever the CO2 is moving from the blood to the alveoli, that's what it's contributing to. Okay, so it contributes in gas exchange. All right, the second one is type two. And type two, oh, before I do this, it's not just important to know their actual, sh their function, it's important to know their shape. Which one of these? Because obviously I could have said any one of these could be type one and any one could have been type two. The type one are these squamous-like epithelial cells. The cuboidal-like epithelial cells is type 2, okay? And there are more type 1 than there is type 2. So the type 1 are more abundant, type 2 is less abundant. So again, I should under, put under this, this is actually squamous epithelial cells. Epithelial cells. Okay, type 2 alveolar cells are going to be this cuboidal one and they contribute to a protein lipid complex called surfactant. So they play a role in producing this, this actual lipid protein detergent complex called surfactant. And we'll talk about him. And they are cuboidal, cuboidal epithelial cells. Okay? Okay, so now we got all that mumbo jumbo out of the way. I wanna explain something here. 
Okay, so bear with me. It's kind of a tough topic for some people, but I'm going to do my best to explain it to you guys. I'm going to represent, again, I told you that there was a water layer right here, right? So there's a water layer here that's actually interacting between these epithelial cells and the air. So let me draw here these circles. And what these circles are representing here, or they're representing the water molecules. Now, water molecules are interesting because they can interact with one another, right? And when they interact with one another, they exert a certain amount of force. It's kind of like an inter intermolecular reaction, right? So these intermolecular attractions or reactions between each other is very interesting. So let me draw a couple more circles here, and then we'll see what I'm talking about with these reactions and forces and cohesive interactions. Okay, so we got a lot of water molecules right here. All of these brownish colored circles are representing water molecules. So it's a thin water layer. So this right here is the water layer. This is the water layer. Here's the cell layer. And then up here, I'll represent it with a couple different types of, I'll represent up here, you're gonna have some oxygen, you're gonna have some CO2, you're gonna have some nitrogen, stuff like that. This is your gas layer, or your air layer, right? So this is where the air is. Now here's what's really cool. These water molecules exert a force on one another. So look at the top, the, the, where the surface tension is really taking place is here at the top layer. So if you have to remember any of these layers, try to remember the top, at least first or second layer. Look what happens here. If we go to the second layer and the third layer, look at this. This guy can exert a force, or it can interact. It can have an intermolecular uh, attraction with this water molecule. It can have an intermolecular attraction to this water molecule. And it can have an intermolecular interaction with this molecule, as well as with the one above it. Same thing for this guy. It can react with this guy, react with this guy, react with this one, and react with this one. Watch, here's the problem. All of these molecules, because of them having this net interaction, in other words, this one has a nice interaction with this guy, nice interaction with this guy, nice interaction with this guy, and nice interaction with him. Here's the problem, ready? Look at this guy. Look at this one on the top. He can interact with the guy next to him. He can interact with the guy on the side of him, and he can interact with the guy below him. But he has no interaction with the person above him. There's no, the, the actual water molecules do not want to interact with the gas. So you know what they do? They're very greedy. You know about vectors? Look at this vector. This vector and this vector, they'll cancel each other out. So these will cancel each other out. If these two vectors cancel each other out, where would the net vector be pointing? Downwards. That's where the water molecule is going to want to go. It's going to want to interact with the water molecules below. And so guess what these water molecules will start doing? These water molecules, not just this one, but this one here, this one here, this one here. If I come over here, this one here, this one here, this one here. And you get the point that look at all these net vectors. This one's pointing down, this one pointing down, this one's pointing down. And if I even did this one, this one's pointing down. These water molecules will start diving to the bottom. As these water molecules on the top and even some of the actual, maybe a layer below, as they start diving to the bottom, what happens to this layer? It gets thinner. As this layer gets thinner, so watch this. Let's say that I actually have this layer here. I take this layer, I put it up here, right? So now I have here, here's my air water interface. And again, this brown is supposed to represent my actual water molecules, right? And let's say originally, here was actually the water molecules, right? But what were the water molecules trying to do? The water molecules are trying to go and drop down to the lower layers. As they try to drop down to the lower layers, right? So as these water molecules start trying to drop down to the lower layers. So for example, let's say I take these water molecules. They're going to start diving down. Well, they're not going to be here. They're going to start trying to move downwards. They're going to try to get closer to these guys. So as they start trying to get closer to these guys, they try to pull the water layer down. Same thing with this one over here. These would try to pull the water layer down. So as they try trying to pull this water layer down, what's happening? It's actually shrinking. It's actually shrinking and getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's trying to keep dropping and going down to the bottom layer. As these water molecules keep trying to go down and drop to the bottom layer, it makes this layer thinner, okay? 
as this layer gets thinner, it actually starts causing the alveoli to develop some type of tension. So as this layer gets thinner, the alveoli starts actually collapsing. And as the alveoli starts collapsing, it starts trying to push the air out. Okay, so let me explain one more time. Because these water molecules right here, they have an interaction to the side of them, an interaction to the other side, and an interaction below, but nothing to interact with above. This will not allow for the alveoli to expand because the water layer can't go up. Okay, it has nothing to interact with. So because of that, because the water does not want to interact with the gases, it goes deeper down into the bulk layers of the water, down here to the bottom layers. As it drops down to the lower layers, it makes this layer thinner. As the layer becomes thinner, it creates a specific type of tension, and that tension is called surface tension. And as that tension starts increasing, it tries to pull on the alveoli, it tries to make the alveoli collapse. Now, you know, there's a guy, his name was uh, Laplace, and he was working on spheres, and he came up with this concept. He came up with this concept that we can determine the pressure that whenever, it, whenever the surface tension is increasing, there's a certain amount of pressure that's being, the alveoli is trying to exert and push on the air to push the air out. They call it a collapsing pressure. He devised this formula which says uh, the change in pressure, you know, this is Laplace law here, change in pressure is equal to two times the tension. And you know what this tension is? Surface tension. Let's write that next to it. This is specifically the surface tension. And then this is going to be over what? This will be specifically over radius. And we'll represent radius as R, okay? So P is right here is supposed to represent pressure. Okay. But specifically, it's a type of pressure. What do we say? As these layers get thinner, because of the water molecules diving to the bottom layers, because they have no interaction with the gas molecules above them, only the water molecules below them, cause this layer to get thinner, and as it create, causes this layer to get thinner, it develops a certain type of surface tension between the water and the air. As it does that, the alveoli starts trying to collapse. As it tries to collapse, it tries to push air out. That's the whole desire, to push air out. When it does that, the pressure by which it pushes the air out is this pressure. So it's called a collapsing pressure. Okay, so we technically call it a collapsing pressure. Okay, so let's, say, let's actually explain this a little bit more then. Let's see how tension can affect this collapsing of the pressure. So for example, let's say that I take this formula and I form two different formulas. So I put P here and I put two times the tension over the radius for this one. And I put over here in a different color. I put this one in this maroonish color. I put pressure equals two times the tension divided by the radius. So in this situation, if the surface tension increases, what can we devise from this then? If the surface tension increases, okay, because of the air-water interaction, okay, because of the air-water interaction, because the water molecules want to dive to the bottom layer, it creates a tension. What is that going to do to the pressure? So in increasing the actual surface tension, increases the collapsing pressure of the alveoli. Increases the collapsing pressure of alveoli. What do we say? Come here. Surface tension. It wants to collapse the alveoli. That's all it is. And if we understand that what is surface tension is due to the air-water interaction and as the water molecules dive to the bottom layer because there's nothing for them to exert their intermolecular force or, or inter interaction above, they're going to drop down, make the layer thinner, which is going to create a tension that tension can cause the alveoli to collapse. And then in the opposite, if you decrease the tension, if you by some situation decrease the tension, and we'll talk about how we decrease the tension, our body has a beautiful way of doing that, and it's called surfactant. If you have the surface tension decreased, what is that gonna do? Okay, well think about the formula. If you decrease this number, what will it do to the, this number? It'll decrease the pressure. So it'll actually decrease the collapsing pressure. So tension and pressure, this collapsing pressure, are directly proportional, right? Of the alveoli. Sweet deal. And again, whose law was this? This was Laplace's law 
of a sphere. But in this case, we're talking about the alveoli. Okay, now, you know what, since we're here, let's see how the radius is affected by it. And that's why we have this diagram. Okay, let's say for some situation, um, you have this alveoli, and let's look at the difference. Look at this one and look at this one. Let's say that this alveoli, by some uh, reason, isn't getting properly inflated because it has a lot of mucus buildup. So let's say that this is a mucus plug right here. That'd be pretty nasty, but you got a big old mucus plug here. And this mucus plug is occluding or it's uh, blocking some of the airflow down into this area. So if it's blocking the airflow, so air is coming here, so flow, so airflow. As the air is flowing, it's going to want to come down here, but there's going to be a lot of uh, friction and resistance, right? So this air will become very underinflated. It's going to be not very, very well inflated. So it's going to be, you know how they call it ventilated, if we say ventilated, and we actually say it's below the normal ventilation, we say it's hypoventilated. So we can say that this alveoli is hypoventilated. And let's say that this alveoli, it's getting a decent amount of air. Okay, it's getting a decent amount of air. So this one, let's say for right now, it's normally ventilated, just for right now. And then we'll see something that's really interesting here. Okay, so say this one's having this mucus plug and this one's normally, normally ventilated. Watch what can happen here. Look at the radius difference here. Look at the radius difference. Look at from this point here, so you know how you take, you know, take radius, you take half of the diameter. So if we come from here to this point here, that's our radius. So the radius here, and then I come from here and I take the radius here. This one must have a much larger radius, right? Let's just say, for example, this radius is two centimeters, even though that's not, it's going to be much smaller than that, but anyway, this is going to be two, I'm sorry, this should be, let's make this one bigger, let's make it two times that, let's make it four centimeters. Let's apply Laplace's law to this. So Laplace's law says that pressure, the collapsing pressure, is equal to two times the tension divided by the radius. If this, in this situation, and let's do this in a different color, let's do this one in this blue. So pressure is equal to two times the tension divided by the radius. In this situation here, the radius is very low because it's underventilated. If the radius is very, very low, what does that do to the collapsing pressure? It increases the collapsing pressure. So the decrease in the radius is gonna do what? The decrease in the radius of this alveoli is going to increase the collapsing pressure of the alveoli. Oh, that is not good. Thank goodness our body has different ways of dealing with this, you know, and I'll explain it in just a second. But just for the heck of it, look at this radius. Let's say that this radius is a little bit larger. All right, it's a little bit larger, okay? And let's, let's say for a second, normally our body doesn't do this, but it, it, usually we have ways of protecting this. If this radius drops down really low and the collapsing pressure of the alveoli becomes too high, what would it do to this alveoli? Collapse it. If it collapses this alveoli, where would the air go? It would go over into this guy. And as the air starts flowing, so normal air is coming this way, but then we add in some extra air from this alveoli because this alveoli collapses. So if this alveoli collapses, it provides some extra air to flow over here. So it was normally ventilated but then it gets extra air from this collapsed alveoli. What would happen to this alveoli? It would become above ventilation, hyperventilated, right? So it's gonna become hyperventilated. All right, well, what happens to the radius then? Well, let's say that the radius even increased. Let's say it was originally four, and because of the alveoli emptying some of his actual air in here, let's say it went up to like five or something like that. Let's say not all the air went over. And so it goes up to about five centimeters. Okay? If that's the case then, we know that the radius is really, really what? Really, really high. If the radius of this is really, really high, what is that gonna do to the actual collapsing pressure? It's gonna decrease the collapsing pressure. So an actual increase in the radius does what to the collapsing pressure? Increase in the radius of the alveoli decreases the collapsing pressure of alveoli. Now, I told you this normally doesn't happen, right? It can happen to certain alveoli in the lungs, but our body has a way to be able to prevent this from happening. In between these alveoli, we have these pores. 
that are connecting the adjacent alveoli. Let's do this in a nice little color. Let's do this one in this red. Look at this. Here's a pore. I know I'm, I'm really, really accentuating the pore here, but it's just for you guys to get the point that these two alveoli are connected. It's kind of like gap junctions in a way. So what does that mean then? That means that some of the air that's in this alveoli can flow over here, right? Some of the air that's in this alveoli can flow over to this alveoli. And some of the air from this alveoli can flow over into this alveoli. You know what this helps? This helps to maintain proper ventilation, normal ventilation between the two alveoli. <laughs> it's amazing. I, I just, it just blows my mind. So this is actually called the alveolar pores. Um, sometimes they even call it the pores of cone. Um, must have been some dude named Cohen who figured that out. But anyway, what are these alveolar pores doing? They're basically allowing for proper, adequate equilibrium of movement between, of gases between the two alveoli to maintain a nice alveoli structure, right? So that there is no collapsing of the alveoli. So that's one thing. Another thing that's also preventing this from happening is surfactant, and we'll talk about that. One more thing, though, before we talk about surfactant. <sighs> Look at this. So if this guy is getting underventilated, if you guys remember from the ventilation perfusion coupling video, look at this. Let's do this one in this pink marker here. Remember ventilation was V over Q and it was normally equaling to about 0.8. We solved that. What happened, what's happening to the ventilation here? It's decreasing. So if it's decreasing, what's that going to mean then? Okay, if it's not getting a lot of air into this area, then I'm not going to be able to allow for a proper amount of exchange. Even though there's no, let's say that there's normal perfusion which is representing as our Q, normal perfusion coming through here, normal amount of blood flow, but this thing is it's underventilated. It's not going to be able to allow for a proper gas exchange. There's not going to be enough oxygen to exchange. So what's going to happen here? There's going to be an inadequate oxygen exchange in this situation. So inadequate exchange of gases. This is super important because if you can't exchange gases, you can't get oxygen into the blood and you can't get CO2 across into the lungs to expire, which can lead to hypoxia and it can lead to maybe even respiratory acidosis. So very si uh, serious situation. Obviously what would happen if this is hypoventilated and you, this is decreasing, this number is decreasing, what do I have to do to fix it? Remember what we said? We would actually decrease the perfusion. So what would happen to the capillaries here? They would constrict, did you guys remember? Opposite scenario, if this is hyperventilated, Apply the formula. V over Q is equal to 0.8. What's happening in this one? It's overventilated. If it's overventilated, then what's going to happen? Let's assume here that there is normal perfusion originally. We always have to think about things before everything's being compensated. But normal perfusion coming through here. So the Q isn't changing yet. But if it's being hyperventilated, there's too much oxygen in here to be able to deliver to the actual blood. There's not enough blood here to be, become adequately oxygenated. So if that's the case then, because there's not enough red blood cells coming through this area to get oxygenated, they'll still get oxygenated, but there's still going to be a lot of air here in the lungs. So they, it gets wasted. So because of this, there's a lot of air being wasted. Okay, because of this situation. Whereas in this one, if there's an inadequate exchange of gases because there's not going to be enough oxygen and CO2 moving across, so in this situation there would be a waste of what? The blood coming through that area. The blood's going to get wasted because there's going to be no use for it. So again, that's why, just to clarify here, again, if the ventilation is low, what does that mean for the amount of oxygen that's going to be in this alveoli? That means that the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be low. So if you want, if you want blood to come here, here, it's not going to get properly ventilated. So I want to decrease my perfusion to be able to bring it back to normal, right? So that's why you would actually do what? You would constrict these capillaries. Because if blood flow came through here, it would be a waste of the blood. You don't want to waste the blood. You want to send it to areas where it's properly ventilated so it can actually get enough oxygen. Okay, so in this situation when the partial pressure is low, constrict those pulmonary capillaries and send it away from that area. But again, that can cause a lot of problems in the body. And in the opposite of this situation, it's hyperventilated. So what does that mean for the partial pressure of oxygen in this area? That means it's high. So what are you going to want to do to the actual capillaries here? We said if the ventilation is high, what do you got to do to the perfusion? 
increase the perfusion. So what would you do to the capillaries? You would dilate the capillaries. And as you dilate them, you'd have more blood flow coming in here so that the air, the extra air that you have in here wouldn't go wasted, okay? All right, that takes care of that thing. Now, one last thing before we talk about surfactant. There's this really interesting thing that happens. If, remember how we said that this alveoli, if the pressure was really, really high, it would collapse theoretically, right? But we do have these mechanisms to try to prevent it, but it still can happen. If this alveoli collapses because of this increase in surface tension, you know what happens? As it collapses, it, it creates like a vacuum, like a vacuum, and it pulls fluid. You know what, what's the most abundant fluid inside of the blood plasma? Water, right? So there's a lot of water flowing here in the blood plasma. When this collapses, it creates like a vacuum and pulls some of the water out of the pulmonary capillaries and in here, into the actual alveoli. What does that do? As the water is getting pulled into this alveoli, you know what it's gonna do? It's gonna put water in here in the alveoli, which can affect gas exchange. But not only that, as water is accumulating, what's happening to that respiratory membrane? It's getting thicker. What did we say was the relationship between a thick respiratory membrane and gas exchange? The thicker the membrane, the decrease the gas exchange. That's another problem. So what are the three things that surface tension can really, really wreck us up? It can cause collapsing of the alveoli if the surface tension is really high, right? What else could it do? It also could create unequal ventilation, right, of these alveoli. And on top of that, if these alveoli do collapse, what will it do? It'll pull water into the alveoli that are actually collapsing and create a lot of pulmonary edema, right? And that can be a bad thing. Okay, so that takes care of surface tension. Now the question is, how does our body deal with it? Surfactant. Okay, let's come back over here to this diagram for a second. So if we look over here, we had these water molecules diving to the bottom. Well, guess what? The type two alveolar cells come to the rescue. Okay, surfactant, surfactant. Let's actually talk about surfactant right over here. So surfactant is actually going to be a lipid protein complex, right? So surfactant is a lipid protein complex. Now you might ask, okay, well, how much of it is lipid and how much of it is protein? Don't worry, we're getting there, all right? It's 90% lipids and it's about 10% proteins. Okay, so let's look at, before we do anything, let's look at the structure of this actual surfactant. And then after we talk about the structure, let's talk about when it's synthesized, okay? And then what it does. So let's talk about the structure, when it's synthesized, and what it does. Okay, first off, let's look at the lipid component. So the lipid component over here, let's see, let's draw the lipid component in this, bluish color here. There is actually going to be these two fatty acid tails that are connected. And these fatty acids are approximately 16 carbons in length. So what do you call these 16 uh, carbon fatty acid structures? You know they call it, well if it's one, you call it the actual, what? You call it the palmitoyl, right? It's a, it's a palmitoyl group. The other one is going to be another palmitoyl group. So we call this collectively a di palmitoyl fatty acid group, right? So, so far we have dipalmitoyl, right? Then we have another thing. We have this next thing right here, look at this. This right here is actually gonna be consisting of a phosphatidyl group here. So the phosphatidyl group is actually gonna be hydrophilic. So this part here is actually hydro Philic. And this part here, the dipalmatoil, which is consisting of the fatty acids, this is hydrophobic. That's going to be super critical here for when we explain this mechanism. The last thing is it does have one more thing connected to it. It's actually going to have these like uh, choline groups, which is an essential vitamin like nutrient. So they actually completely call this whole name here, they call it phosphatidylcholine. So there's this phosphatidylcholine group, which is gonna be consisting of this 
uh, polar head-like structure with these actual essential vitamin-like nutrient structures called choline. But you know that's not it. There's proteins, many different proteins coming off of this uh, sucker here. Let's show these proteins in, let's do these ones in blue here. There's actually going to be specifically albumin, which is the same albumin that you see within the blood plasma, okay? There's gonna be another one which is gonna be IgA antibodies, immunoglobulins, right, for the passive immunity. I'm mean, sorry, but it's a part of our actual innate immunity, like type of structure, right? And then what else are we gonna have? Then we're gonna have these apoproteins. And there's mainly four, four types, four types of apoproteins. There's actually gonna be type A, B, C, and D. But we call them surfactant protein, type A, surfactant protein type B, surfactant protein type C, and surfactant protein type D. Okay, now that we have all of this, let's go ahead and see the next thing. So we said, what's the first thing we were gonna look at? We were gonna look at the structure of surfactant. We know that it's 90% lipids, 10% proteins. The lipid component is the dipalmatile group, which is hydrophobic. Then what else is it gonna have? It's gonna have these 16 carbon fatty acid chains, which is the dipalmatile group. Then it's gonna have this pink head, which is the phosphatidylcholine group, which is hydrophilic. It's a little bit more polar. Then it's gonna have these 10% of the proteins, right? Albumin, IgA antibodies, and apoproteins, type A, type B, type C, type D. Okay, what's the next thing we said? We said, when is it made and how is it like secreted? That's the next question. So, you know in the fetus during the gestational period around the 24th week? So around the 24th week, let's come over here. So around the 24th week of gestation, the, the actual fetus starts producing this protein lipid complex called surfactant. So around the 24th week of gestation, the surfactant production begins. And it actually is a very slow process, very, very slow process. But by the time the female gets closer to the 34th week of gestation, the surfactant production starts going really high. So in the beginning parts, like 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, the actual surfactant production is kind of low. But as she starts approaching, the 34th to 35th week of gestation. Then the actual surfactant production increases. So look, let's say right here, the surfactant production as we get closer to the 35th week increases. So surfactant, surfactant production increases, right? As we get closer to the 34th week. Now some of you might be like, okay, well why is it slow in the beginning? and then a lot more as we get closer to the 34th week. As the female approaches this 34th week, getting closer to that, she starts producing a hormone. You know the hormone within the uh, zona fasciculata, it's called cortisol? So you know the woman is actually producing a hormone called cortisol? And cortisol, you know it's actually a, a glucocorticoid? So it's one of the glucocorticoids. She can also produce other different types of glucocorticoids. Cortisol, though, one of the glucocorticoids, can actually help to stimulate this process. But primarily, it enhances the actual, the, the cortisol levels become very, very high as the female approaches, as she starts getting closer to the 34th week. So because the cortisol levels start increasing as you get closer to like the 29th, 30th, 31st, 32nd, 33rd, 34th week, the actual surfactant production starts increasing. Why is that important? Because you know in certain people, if they actually are prematurely born, they aren't able to produce enough surfactant. So let's say that the individual is born before the 34th week, like maybe like a little bit closer to like, I don't know, 32nd, 31st uh, week. That can cause a decreased amount of surfactant available and it can produce what's called infant respiratory distress syndrome. We'll talk about why that's important. But again, I want you to understand when it's produced, it's produced during the actual gestational period and it's dependent upon hormone levels like cortisol. Now. When this is actually made, it's made by the type 2 alveolar cells. So let's see how it's actually secreted. So here's our type 2 alveolar cells over here. These type 2 alveolar cells, when they start making it, they store them inside of these actual, like, large globules inside of our actual uh, alveolar cells. And when they're stored in these, like, look at this. I'm going to draw like, some circles here. 
They're like these big, big globules of surfactant. This whole big globules of surfactant, they look like big old bodies. You know what that's called? That's called lamellar bodies. And then what happens is, whenever the actual type 2 alveolar cells exocytose the actual uh, surfactant, but specifically it's in this form called lamellar bodies, it comes out in like this tubular-like fashion. And when it comes out in this tubular fashion, this tubular-like structure here is called tubular myelin. So what is this here structure called? It's called tubular myelin. So again, lamellar bodies is the actual big old globular structure inside of the cell. When it's pushed out of the cell by exocytosis, when this comes out of the cell by exocytosis, it becomes this structure called tubular myelin. Why am I telling you this? Because tubular myelin, imagine I take a big old string of tubular myelin. As I take a big old string of tubular myelin, let's say I pretend here's a circle, here's a circle, here's a circle, another one, another one. Okay, you get it. This part of the tubular myelin that's a surfactant molecule. And that's one too. So this would be surfactant one, surfactant two, surfactant three, surfactant four, surfactant five. You get the point. This tubular myelin structure is consisting of many, many surfactant molecules. Okay. So we talked about its structure. We talked about when it's produced. We talked about how it's actually released. Now let's talk about what it's doing and how it's actually preventing surface tension. Okay. Let's bring that molecule and put him right here. So now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to get rid of these here for a second. And now look what happens here. I'm going to put this guy right here, and I'll put another one right over here. Let me put another one right over here. I'm going to put another one right there. Now watch what happens. This was the phosphatidylcholine group. What was coming off of the phosphatidylcholine group? You were having the dipalmatoyl groups, right, which were the 16 carbon fatty acids. And then... What's so significant about this? All right, look at this. So as, if you guys remember, the water molecules, what were they doing? If we follow this water molecule right here. It was exerting a force to the side, to the side, and down, but nothing to exert what? Above. Look at this actual guy here, this phosphatidylcholine group. It actually can interact with the water molecule, what? To the side. It can interact with the molecule to this side and it can even interact with the water molecule below. Now you might be saying, okay, well there's still no, well, there's no, no force upwards. Guess what? Yes, there is. You see this part here? What do we say this part was? This was the dipalmatoyl fatty acid group. This dipalmatoyl fatty acid group is hydrophobic. It does not want to be in the water. What does that mean? It's going to want to be staying out here. And because it wants to stay out here, it's going to create a force that's trying to pull and pull and pull this actual surfactant molecule upwards. As it does that, what happens then? As this pulls this upwards, it decreases the surface tension. Because now what's going to happen? Some of the water molecules might come back up to the surface. So as this is pulling this up, some of the water molecules might come back up to the surface here. What happens to the actual water layer? It goes back to its normal thickness. When it goes back to its normal thickness because of the surfactant, what does that do to the tension? It decreases the surface tension. Okay, so again, surfactant molecule here is having interactions with all directions around him. And because of the hydrophobic fatty acid tails, it's pulling the surfactant molecule upwards. As it does that, some of these water molecules here on the bottom bulk layers go upwards and draw themselves upwards to interact with the actual surfactant molecules. As that does that, what's it going to do to the cohesive interactions with all of these other water molecules? It's going to decrease the cohesiveness. It's going to break up those intermolecular forces, and it's going to allow for the water molecules to move up to the top and allow for this actual water layer to expand. When the water layer expands, the surface tension decreases. Okay. Now, now that we know that, let's see really quickly here how this surfactant eliminates all of these problems. Okay. Well, let's look at this situation right here first. Surfactant was produced. What was the purpose of surfactant? To decrease surface tension. If it decreases the surface tension, what's going to happen here? Actually, wait, we already have it right over here. We already have it right over here. Look, the, surface, the actual surface tension decreased. What causes this surface tension to decrease? 
surfactant. Okay, and why? Because surfactant was actually going to be decreasing the cohesiveness of the water molecules and trying to pull the actual water molecules from the bottom upwards to decrease the surface tension and allow for the alveoli to expand. So it wants to decrease the collapsing pressure of the alveoli. Okay, now let's see how this affects the radius. Okay, this one's a little bit more tricky. Let me do this right over here for a second. Let me make two small alveoli down here in the bottom. Let me get this out of the way here. Okay, look at this. Let's say here, I have this alveoli here with a small radius and I have this alveoli over here with a really big radius. And again, what was this layer right here? Let's say this layer right here, I'm gonna draw in blue, was the water layer. This is the water layer right here. And that was actually creating that surface tension between the air-water interface. What did we do to treat this issue? We brought in surfactant, right? As we bring in the surfactant molecules, let's say that we show the surfactant in this pinkish color. All right, so this surfactant molecule, let's pretend it's actually coating this air-water interface. And it's coating this air-water interface. Look at what I'm doing. What do you notice is different right away? You see how this actual surfactant layer is easily coated. It's very good. It's very nice and dense around all of this air-water interface. While this one is more distributed, it has a lot of breaks in certain points of the actual surfactant molecules. What does that mean then? If something has a larger radius, a very large radius, okay, this is diameter, but you imagine half of this is the radius. Here, let's just do it anyway. Let's fix this here, this point here. This is the radius. If you have a large radius, the surfactant actual distribution is going to be less. If the surfactant distribution is less across this alveoli, what does that mean for the actual surface tension? There's gonna be a little bit more surface tension here. So this alveoli is gonna to wanna to collapse a little bit more, even though the radius is much larger. Isn't that amazing? And the last thing, if the surfactant is actually, if this has a small radius, very small radius, the surfactant distribution is gonna be nice and condensed and concentrated in this area. So if that's the case, the, sur the actual surface tension is going to decrease. And then if you look at this situation now, here they had a decrease in radius, right? If there was a decrease in the radius, what did that do? Decrease in the radius increased the collapsing pressure. Well, if you decrease the radius, how can we fix that? What did we say? Surface tension, right? We actually would do what? we would decrease the surface tension. That's what we said. We would allow for the alveoli to expand and that would help to decrease this collapsing pressure. And then what do we say with this last one? We said here, the radius was really, really big. And when the radius is really big, what does that want to do to the pressure? It decreases the collapsing pressure. And whenever you try to decrease this collapsing pressure, that's great, but let's keep everything even. We want equal alveoli. So how does that happen? What do we do to the surface tension? What do we do? We increase the surface tension because it's not going to be, surfactant is not evenly distributed. And because of that, surface tension increases. What does that do to the actual collapsing pressure? It brings it up a little bit, but tries to bring both of these two into homeostasis. Equal amount. So there's not, we don't want this one to collapse and this one not to collapse. We want them to equally have this equal flow of gases between the two. Okay? Now, that is how the surfactant is working in this situation. If this individual is not able to produce surfactant, you can imagine how hard it would be for these alveoli to expand. If this individual, that, that little infant who was born prematurely and wasn't able to produce enough surfactant, if that infant was born early, she doesn't have this surfactant. If she doesn't have the surfactant, what's the whole thing that's going to happen? If she doesn't have surfactant, there's going to be a lot of surface tension. What do we say surface tension would do? It would want to collapse the alveoli, it would create unequal alveoli, and it would want to pull water into the alveoli. Right? That's the whole purpose. Surfactant is trying to present, prevent all of those things. If the baby is born prematurely, she doesn't have surfactant, and all of those things can happen. And in order for this baby to breathe, they have to put her onto a, a child on a mechanical ventilator to be able to push air into the baby so that the baby can actually inflate the alveoli because the alveoli constantly want to collapse. And when the baby is born, you know when a baby is born, uh, they cut the umbilical cord and then there's decrease in oxygen levels inside of the baby and that triggers hypoxia, activates the respiratory centers within inside of the baby and triggers the baby to do what? 
activate some of the muscles, right? And when the muscles are activated, what happens? They contract and try to bring air in. What is that called? It's called the first cry. Well, in this individual, it's still gonna do the same thing. They'll cut the umbilical cord if they have infant respiratory distress syndrome. They'll cut the cord. They'll still have hypoxia. It'll trigger the actual nervous system to trigger inspiration. But when they come to inspire, the alveoli don't wanna open because they have to have so much, it takes so much energy and so much work to open up those alveoli, the babies have a hard time breathing and they go into distress and they have to put them on the ventilator, right? Last thing I wanna mention here is these apoproteins. proteins. Apo protein A and apo protein D are really important because what they help to do is they play a role in your um, opsonization reactions. So they play a role in opsonization. This one here, as well as D. And if you guys remember what opsonization is, it's where you tag, these proteins could tag specific types of foreign matter and trigger them for phagocytosis. So that's pretty cool. So there's a little bit of actual immunity component. Whereas B and C, they play a role in the distribution, the rate of the distribution and spread of the actual surfactant. So they play a role in the spread, the rate of which the surfactant is spread. So spreading of surfactant. All right, engineers, we talked about a lot of information in this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it made sense. I, I really, really do. Um, if it did, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, hit that subscribe button. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.